instead of focusing on winning arguments, we're teaching the basic fundamentals of sales and marketing and how we can use them to win in the world of politics, teaching you how to meet people where they're at on the issues they care about. Welcome to The Brian Nichols Show. Well, happy Monday there, folks. Brian Nichols here on The Brian Nichols Show, and thank you for joining us on, of course, another fun-filled episode. I am, as always, your humble host. And today we are kicking things off. Oh man, we're going to be getting all sorts of people excited, mad, angry, in agreement, uh, in disagreement across the board. And we're going to be talking about Roe versus Wade. Olivia Rondo returning to the Brian Nichols Show. Welcome back, Olivia. Hey, I thought you were going to say that people were going to be excited, mad, and angry that I was coming back. And I was like, oh, okay. (laughs) They're like, not Olivia, not again, please. (laughs) Too good for the show. Why is she wasting her time over on Brian's program? Good God. I'm I'm a very charitable person, so I like to toss toss some bones here and there. Well, Olivia, you've been literally everywhere, it seems, over the past few months now. You've been on the show, uh, I think, a couple times at this point. You had one of our our uh, solo um, one-on-ones you did with the audience back a couple months ago as well. So the audience has gotten to know you, but candidly, we've been growing left and right here at the audience uh, for, for the Brian Nichols Show. So we've been reaching a lot of new people who have not had the chance yet to meet you. So let's kind of do this before we dig into, yes, this greater Roe versus Wade debate with uh, that uh, little... A brief that was released uh, behind the scenes there from the Supreme Court. But let's introduce you uh, again to the Brian Nichols Show audience. Olivia, who are you and what got you so, uh, I don't know, in- intertwined where you don't seem to have a moment to spare in this greater liberty world we find ourselves in? Okay, so for those who don't know, I'm Olivia Rondo. I am a quote-unquote liberty activist. Kennedy on Fox Business actually kind of coined that term for me. So I started like, I adopted that and now I call myself that. But ideologically, I'm more of a conservatarian. Um, You know, I've supported Republicans. I've supported libertarians. I'm really about ideas and individuals over parties as a registered independent. So that's kind of where I've, like my... um, I would say my perspective is coming from, you know, in the political sense. I got into politics at a young age. Uh, it was the 2016 election. I'm going to date myself here. <laughs> um, I was in high school. So um, it kind of started off as me being like, oh, my God, like these Trump supporters. Like I had friends who were Trump supporters. I went to like a rural, you know, white high school in like Southern Maryland. And I was like, oh, my God, like all my friends who are not racist to me, who have always treated me nice. I was on the wrestling team. So I was friends with like a, basically a lot of white dudes essentially. And I was like, how are these people, you know, talking about Trump and supporting Trump. And so I go home, talk to my dad. I'm like, dad, like all these kids at school are talking about Trump. You know, I don't know what to do because I was told, you know, I, I was told on social media, um, you know, by my peers and classmates, some of them who were not on the wrestling team. So some of them, um, you know, uh, I wasn't like a bunch of humanities classes. So, you know, how that goes, uh, a bunch of humanities, <laughs> kids, theater kids and stuff are like, no, they're racist. So, you know, I had an internal conflict about it. And my dad's like, what are you like what are you talking about republicans aren't racist trump isn't racist like i'm voting for trump but my dad you know my dad's a black guy so it that started the gears turning in my head so i was like okay clearly i've been lied to because all these people i know like respect love are friends with are you know right wing or republican and i'm now just figuring out that republicans don't have to be racist that they can support trump for completely economic reasons or social reasons that are completely you know doesn't have anything to do with race. And I, I believe that's the truth for the majority of Trump supporters is that it's not because they hate Mexicans, it's not because they hate black people. You know, I think that um, the white working class, you know, the, the majority of Trump's base has been kind of slandered as as racist. And I almost fell for that. You know, I was, I was a kid when this happened. And so I, I'm like, well, clearly the Democrats are lying to me. The identity politics is really not working out for the black community. So I do some research into Hillary Clinton first because, you know, 2016 election, I'm like, well, what's the other side putting up? And I was like, no, like we cannot. I was like 16 years old looking at like Benghazi, looking at the Clinton Foundation. I was like, we cannot elect this woman. I don't care if she's a woman. Like by this time I'm done with identity politics. I don't care about feminism. I don't care if we're going to elect the first woman president. I'm just like, she is an evil woman. She's a nasty woman. Like that's it. And so from then on, I kind of got known like around the school as like, oh, she's that conservative, that conservative girl, that black conservative, whatever, whatever. And it was kind of controversial. I got kicked out of the Black Student Union, actually, my freshman year of high school, as I, you know, start down this journey leading up to the 2016 election. 
And I felt super lonely, felt super isolated. Um, like there were conservatives at my school, but they didn't look like me. You know, there were people, a couple of people that looked at me like me at my school, but they kicked me out of the Black Student Union. So I really felt like I needed to reach out to more people who were similar to me in that they didn't fit into that identity politics box. So I start going on social media, you know, I make a Twitter account and then it just blew up. It, it really just blew up almost immediately. So I created it, I think in like February, 2018 and by like April or May I already had like 10,000 followers. And I was still like, I think 17 or 16 or 17 at this point. And it was a lot for me to deal with and handle. So I was like, what am I going to do with this platform? So I started making videos, some comedy videos, commentary, you know, usually related to politics. And I got a lot of hate for it. So locally, you know, the locals, when the locals first find your page, it, it goes crazy. I don't know if the locals find your page yet, Brian, but um, they were like trying to post my address, send me death threats, saying they're going to pull up on me and kill me. Like people were really hating on me for being at the time, which is very controversial, like a minority Trump supporter. And, wow. you know, as I got older, a couple years older, and my, my my platform starts to grow and I become more connected with people, I'm like, hmm, this whole time I thought that, you know, when I turned 18, I was just going to be, you know, registered to vote as a Republican. But, you know, some other people have great ideas as well. And I found myself supporting a lot of libertarians. And I, you know, without social media, I would never heard about what libertarian is or what it means or what the libertarian party is. Like, I just would have never heard of it. It's not taught in schools. And, um, you know, I took like AP government and all that in high school was not taught in class. So without Twitter, I would have, you know, I probably would have remained just kind of like your average Trump supporter. No tea, no shade. Like, if that's your opinion, that's your opinion. But I've come to the point where I will be a, I, I frequently critique Trump on some of his decisions and policies and endorsements, especially now these days, um, from a more of a right wing libertarian or conservative libertarian or liberty Republican, like all these different names, they all kind of apply to me. I am an independent, but like I said before, uh, I support a lot of libertarians and Republicans as well. And I'm friends with people on both sides and I work for and with people on both sides. So I um, kind of still don't even fit into a strict political box, but going on Twitter and just connecting with so many different people has definitely aided my political growth and ideological growth and even personal growth. It's made me more confident. Like I feel like I can, you know, I can just talk freely about my politics now, which, you know, four or five years ago, I would try to hide it and try to avoid the subject just to, um, you know, avoid the ridicule. And so now, of course, as I'm about to hit 90,000 followers on Twitter just a couple years later, and, you know, I'm on uh, Fox and Fox Business like every week or so, and, you know, going on podcasts like yours and shows like yours and, and stuff, I get to connect with a lot more people and my audience has grown, you know, pretty wide. And I try to be the person that I needed as a teenager, like the person that did not fit into a political box. Like, you know, I have so many, this is the best demographic of followers I have. I have like a huge demographic of like gay teenagers who are like either Rep Republican or Libertarian who get so much hate and they all follow me and they all flock to me. <laughs> it's crazy. But like, I get so, I, I get a huge diverse group of like you know, LGBT people, black people, Hispanics, Native Americans, Asians, and white people as well, because I'll stick up for the white working class. Like a lot of people don't like Democrats don't, you know, and even the Republican base sometimes let the white working class get slandered as racists and scary bigots and stuff just yep. for being Trump supporters. So I just try to be that person that makes those people with um, controversial views and controversial opinions, especially related to their, their identity, um, I just try to reach them and make them feel more comfortable, you know, speaking up and speaking out. So I always like am encouraging people, you know, make a social media page or create your organization on campus or, you know, do something, get active. You know, I've worked on a bunch of different campaigns. I've written, you know, freelance writing and staff writing for a bunch of different places, um, mostly like libertarian and conservative places. But really any method I can use to get the message out, I will. So I'm basically done like every different medium it comes to like with politics and worked at like every different level when it comes to like running a campaign or just all the way down to door knocking like basically everything yep and it all needs to be done <laughs> honestly like that if you want to be successful in any 
way, shape, or form, whether it's politics, sales, anything, you have to go out and actually put in the blood, sweat, and tears. But you brought up a couple things, and I wrote them down. So one, you brought up these controversial views. I wrote that down, and I put it in quotes, because I don't know, Olivia, if it's so much controversial views as, it, as it's been stifled views. Uh, I think what we're seeing, and, and you brought this up, and it hit me, because I've seen this a lot, too, where you've seen people be afraid. For the past four or five years, I was over on Tim Pool back a month or so ago, and I was talking about this about you know sales leaders and and business owners who are so tired, and they're now starting to stand up and speak out. I just had uh, my program here, Steve Harrison. He wrote the book "Can't Sell, Won't Sell." He's from the United Kingdom, and he's talking about Adland, all your advertisers and marketers out there who have been just completely co-opted by the the leftist groupthink over in in their corporate world who now they're seeing a complete revolution, a complete fighting back from people who have been just ignored, the, the people who are actually out there doing the, the grunt work. So we're seeing more people now actually, I think, starting to engage in the conversations that, frankly, they were too afraid to engage with in the past. And one of these conversations, one of these hot topics that I think has been really elevated to one of the most just dangerous topics to discuss, and that is the abortion debate. And we're seeing this come to a head right now, the leak of the Roe v. Wade ruling, which it appears that the nine uh, members in the Supreme Court justice will be ruling 5-4 in a conservative lean towards, yes, uh, reverting Roe v. Wade uh, now. So it's no longer going to be a federal issue on abortion, but rather now we'll go back to the states the way, I mean, frankly, I think a lot of us would be okay with. I thought we would be okay with that. It seems that's the best step forward, at least in my world, versus big, gigantic national divorce is at least let each individual state decide you know, whether or not they're going to uh, have abortion and, and whether they're going to have different restrictions on abortion. Like, If you're going to have that conversation, let's not do a cookie-cutter approach for the entire United States of America. Let's at least bring this down to the states and then let individuals decide. I mean, I just moved from Philadelphia, PA, out to Indiana. There's a reason for that. It's not just because I'm a big fan of corn and flat land and really, really nice people, but also the fact that the values out here are very different than the Northeast. And the values matter, especially over the last two years we saw it. And I think we're seeing right now the conversation of values, morals. It's coming to the forefront. Parents are pissed off. They saw what their kids are learning in school. They're standing up and fighting back. You have business owners who just saw that their businesses could be closed down on a whim versus what's essential versus not essential. They're pissed off. They're ready to go ahead and fight back. And also, I talk about uh, you have sales pros, executives, entrepreneurs. You just go across the greater business world. People who quite literally are having, in some cases, half, if not more, of their income taken away and then used by government to do God knows whatever whatever uh, it says government do good program is actually supposed to be doing. Uh, but in reality, we all know that the money's going towards some tactical bomb who's going to go ahead and bomb some poor little kid over in you know Afghanistan, Pakistan, somewhere over in the Middle East. So. You, you can't feel good about your tax dollars going to fix the potholes on your road. No, your dollars are going overseas. So we're seeing across the board, Olivia, people standing up and fighting back. Now let's go to the topic at hand today, Roe versus Wade, right? This is such uh, an intense conversation because I think part of the problem has been, and I promise this is where we come full circle, back to the point in the quotes, the controversial views, it was labeled controversial for a really long time to be pro-life. To, to be pro-life was considered outside of the mainstream by the people controlling the, the microphone. And I think what we're finding here, especially in an era of more and more decentralized platforms, is that actually not only do more people not uh, stand in the position of being just overtly pro-choice, but as a matter of fact, even those who are pro-choice, they do have some reservations to the late term abortions, the the you know anything past the second trimester, they get a little weary of, and I I think Ray that speaks to that there is a very large moral ethical conversation that we're not frankly having because if we start to have that conversation, then we're going to have to come to some some lines, right? We're going to have to decide, okay, what is life and what is worth being protected if it is life, and and all of a sudden that will make it so. You can no longer hide behind the isms. Now reality becomes reality. Unless, of course, we go back to the, well, I'm not a biologist, but Olivia, that's me on my soapbox. What are your thoughts? So first of all, the way that the draft opinion got leaked, I was 
I was just floored that that was allowed to happen. I'm still floored that nothing, I don't really see anything being done about it. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe that they have identified the leaker officially or have done anything to bring them to justice, whatever that may be. Yeah, nothing so, yet. Yeah, that to me is insane. The fact that um, as a result that people are gathering outside of Justice Alito's house and some of the other justices' houses, I believe, and you know, at their personal homes, throwing garbage and shouting at them in megaphones and all those kind of things. Like, this is not going to persuade anybody to change their minds. And this is like the stupidest way to intimidate somebody is to show the other side of the aisle that you're immature, you can't handle, um, you know, other people's opinions, and you just are disrespectful. You're a disrespectful person showing up to somebody's personal home. So there's that, first of all. I don't think that there's strategies to, you know, um, uh, uh, make it so that Roe is not overturned uh, are, are really failing and, and really fall short of, you know, accomplishing their goal, which is to me, yep. it's a good thing because I support um, overturning Roe v. Wade. I support the decision going back to the States. And what I find hilarious is that there's a lot of people around here. Like I'm, I'm outside of DC and Maryland. There's a lot of people around here and I spent half my time in LA as well uh, who are freaking out, protesting all the kind of stuff. I'm like, you guys realize that if it goes back to the States, California is not going to. <laughs> Nothing's happening. I don't understand why in all these liberal states, people are freaking out. Like they're literally losing their minds. I, I really don't understand that part. Um, as for the pro-life versus pro-choice thing, I've never seen it really as black and white. Um, I, you know, not to be um, ironic, but I, I am literally not a biologist so i can't really give you an exact date when like the heartbeat starts or something like that but you know my my unscientific opinion is that you know life ends when the heartbeat stops so i my philosophy is that that's when it starts and so i don't support a like a sweeping ban of all abortion. I, I, I don't support these bills that are coming up where there should be no exceptions whatsoever. Um, I find those to be very black and white, something that very few people would really agree to. And people are going to continue to protest if that's the way that things are going. I understand that certain people have their religious beliefs and may believe that life starts, you know, even be before conception that, you know, God has planned every soul and all that. And that's a very, you know, righteous, virtuous belief to have, but I don't think you should push that on other people on the flip side you know after the um heart starts beating i do believe that's a life and you know abortions are very medically different i have done a little bit of research on this abortions are very medically different from you know the the from within the first couple months you know from the first nine weeks um to onto the second and third trimesters they, they look very different um one of them involves literally ripping off limbs and crushing skulls and vacuuming out pieces of a mother's uterus so to me that's really disgusting um, whenever I go and research it and, and, and stumble across like, you know, graphic images, I, I want to throw up. It, it's very, it's very hurtful and harmful, I think, to the mother and the baby, because at that point, you know, when there's brain, a heart, you know, arms and legs, I'm just like, no, can't can't fade and i think that people should generally be more responsible and um that's what it comes down to because uh you know the vast majority of abortions are not for um uh not for the baby you know threatening the life of the mother or they're not for rape or incest um so at the end of the day people should be more responsible um so going back to the states again california places like maryland dc you know where i live at nothing nothing really is going to change here i mean in maryland they have proposed a crazy bill that would basically let an, a, a baby that survived an attempted abortion to basically die you know on the operating table after the mother delivers it so wow. it is i i do have some strong feelings about late-term abortions um early term i think that people should be able to come to a compromise on it. But I also understand that's pretty realistic because we have the religious right who believes generally that, you know, life begins at conception and that there should be no exceptions regardless of rape, incest, you know, things like that, which I very much disagree with. Um, and then there's the far left that believes that a fetus is a fetus is, is basically a clump of cells until it exits the mother's birth canal. So you can, you should be able to abort a pregnancy, you know, a week before you give birth, a day before you give birth. And it's that disgusts me just as much as, you know, 
forcing a teenager to carry a rape baby. So it just, it is a very, very difficult situation where I don't know if there's an answer. I really don't know if there's an answer to That's why I supported going back to the States because at least people in these localities, like, you know, in the deep South where a lot of people are very religious, they don't want abortion in their state. Okay. You know, make your law, make your law. I can't stop you if that's what you vote on and if that's what you support. But a, a big federal sweeping legislation one way or the other is not the answer. No. And and I think I do actually maybe have a solution. And it's the solution we try to promote in our, our greater liberty worlds across the board. And that is to make the problem no longer a problem by inherently presenting better solutions outside of the confines of public policy decision making. Um, if if we are able to create a situation where abortions are no longer the desired uh, tool or or practice to solve the problem, and that is in this case, and I can't believe that the words are coming in my mouth, but the problem air quotes is uh, either a to the point you made the the very medically rare situations that we see or those extreme circumstances or B, and this is the the part that is heartbreaking, that the vast majority of abortions who are simply unwanted, unplanned, unprepared for pregnancies. And, and we can have, you know, a conversation about the morals, ethics of that. But regardless of that, if we're able to go out and start to build better solutions that help either you know medically create alternatives societally create alternatives um or yes just change the conversation then i think we're able to make the conversation i mean this is the part that i think people forget and this blew me away when actually i heard this that abortion has been declining precipitously over the past five ten years because as medical advancements have now grown and, and yes there have been downsides to those those medical advancements especially from a cultural standpoint but we've seen the need for abortions to decrease and as such we've seen the number of abortions decrease so we have seen that when we are able to put our best foot forward with actually bringing real solutions to the table outside of the confines of government beyond just to your point, Olivia, and I think it was very well put, having the, the black or white, yes, no, one size fits all approach for, in this case, the entire country. Uh, you know, I, I think we're going to be in a much better spot if we can start to build those better solutions and if we can do it from a state level. Right. And and this, I think, will help, you know, especially from a legal standpoint. And, and, or maybe not legal, but a political standpoint, and it goes into the legal, is it will eliminate a lot of the barriers that maybe have been presented from people entering into trying to build these solutions. And I think there's one area we need to focus on, and, and we should frankly be raising up more, just like Corey DeAngelis is doing with school choice, is going around educating lawmakers on what, what holds people back from engaging in acts like adoption. What, what in, it holds people back from engaging in alternative forms of contraception, and, uh, you know, before abortion becomes something on the table, what can we do medically to help I innovate research to help with these very terrible, rare forms of name, you know, the, the birth defect here, and, and how can we help change the conversation? So, I say all that, Olivia. I think this is a, a conversation and a topic that, frankly, it will never get easy. It, frankly, should never be easy because the topic that we're discussing is just it, it, it is a very uncomfortable and frankly it is dealing with those who are i would dare say are the most vulnerable in our society um and that is the unborn uh you know right there with children you know i'd say the unborn whether you think it is a life or not they are the most vulnerable there's nothing they can do to defend themselves we are literally their caretakers so um with all that being said that's me again on my my soapbox for the day i know this is a very uh, you know a very heated conversation right now across the board in our country so i hope I hope people can take this away and learn how to engage in a more civil conversation and a civil dialogue, Olivia. So let's do this as we wrap things up. What would be your recommendation for folks to be able to take what we talked about today and then bring it to real people, engage in a conversation and actually find some common ground? So I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that the number one reason for an elective abortion, so meaning that it's not, you know, for anyone's danger or health, is poverty. So when people talk about, oh my God, this, you know, this pregnancy is unplanned, you know, rich people can deal with an unplanned pregnancy. They may not want to, but they have the capabilities to. And so, a, you know, a leftist response might be, well, let's give everyone free childcare. Let's give everyone free food, free education, free, 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 free. But, you know, us as rational minded people, we kind of think a little bit differently and say, well, 
what is stopping that mother? What is stopping this family with an unplanned pregnancy, you know, from being financially stable? Let's roll back these regulations. Let's tax them less. You know, let's stop sending their kids to a whatever random school is in their zip code and provide charter school options, private school options. Like we can change the culture. We can change the economy. We can change the jobs, but really only if we take an anti-government approach because government, you know, through all its trials and tribulations trying to get abortion down, I don't think they've really contributed to the actual number that, you know, abortion is decreasing. I think that um, with the um, the creation of more modern technology and modern career types, such as working from home or doing contract gig work, such as like Uber and, um, you know, Uber Eats, things like that, where there's a lot of flexibility, I think that that has kind of contributed to kind of a way for people to climb more out of poverty, but we're still not there yet with all the government regulations. Um, they're coming down on gig workers now um, under the guise of trying to get them to all the full-time employee benefits, but that kind of ruins the point of being a gig worker with a flexible schedule. Um, and they're just going to get taxed more on top of that. So we really have to kind of, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, ignore the government. Um, and, in real life, you know, if you're listening to this and you're and you're facing something like this, or if somebody in your life is facing something like this, um, help them. You know, people who get abort or, or people who get abortions, I, I don't think are necessarily evil people. I don't think that the majority of people who get abortions think that it's murder. No, um, I I don't think that these people should be thrown in jail. Like some people are, you know, suggesting. I think these people should be helped. So help that teen you know, that, that pregnant teen in your life, you know, help that pregnant woman in your life who, whose, you know, husband just ran off. You're like, you, you got to help these people and um, we need to create more communities. So small government, limited government at the very local level, I think would be the best way to tackle this problem enough with the federal, the sweeping federal things like Roe v. Wade should have never even made it to like the Supreme court in the first place. Like it's, it's not abortion is not in the constitution. These decisions should be made at the very, very local and small levels by communities who vote on these, you know, vote on these um, policies and vote for people to represent um, their views and ideologies. And so I think that in short, the answer lies in communities, how these communities take care of their, you know, pregnant women and pregnant teens who are in a tough situation and how we view these pregnant women and pregnant teens and try to end the stigma because people make mistakes. It takes two people like, you know, we're all adults here. So let's let's kind of end the um, the, you know, us versus them. You know, people are like, oh, these women, these feminists are baby killers. They're baby killers. Um I think that that would have to, um, that term would have to go to the abortion doctors who know exactly what they're doing. They know that they're pulling apart a baby with limbs and, you know, a heart beating and, and things like that. So let's stop demonizing each other. Let's try to come to a compromise. I think it's very um, unlikely that we will in this time period, but hopefully sometime in the future. Also, <laughs> I would recommend that people, um, if you're into books, um, like dystopian, futuristic type sci-fi things, I have a book recommendation. It's a series called Unwind. Um, and it's basically set in the future of America where the abortion debate has gotten so crazy that there's a whole civil war over it. And at the end of the war, they come to this conclusion that, okay, abortion, federally illegal, sweeping illegal. But as a result of this, the um, basically the value of life has dropped. So parents have basically taken to unwinding or killing their children and selling them for parts. Basically, it's really, really crazy series, but, um, I think it provides a lot of perspective because if you ignore the crazy sci-fi part, you kind of realize that, oh my God, we're like in the beginning stages of like a crazy dystopian future. So the left thinks it's going to be Handmaid's Tale. I don't agree with that. And the right thinks that we're just going to be, you know, chopping babies heads off in the streets. I don't believe in that. But as we go more and more polarized and more and more separate, you'll see that as we demonize each other, the situation does not solve itself. And one more thing, I would like to kind of reiterate one of my points so people don't take it out of context or context. I'm not pro-abortion. 
Um, when I say that I, I want the exceptions for rape, for incest, you know, for very, very early abortions, if we solve these social issues, you know, I obviously don't want rape and incest to happen. So therefore, I don't want these abortions to happen. But in those instances, I find that they may be necessary for that mother if she chooses to make that decision. Um, so if we lessen these social problems, if we lessen sexual abuse, if we let lessen child abuse, if we, you know, curb pov poverty, you know, as we do live in kind of like a poverty industrial system in this nation, um, we will see a decline in abortion and we'll continue to see that decline. So that's kind of all I had to say on that. Sorry for being on a soapbox tangent as well, but yeah. <laughs> No, this is the this is soapbox central here today, and it, it's a, a conversation we're gonna keep having, right, Olivia? And, and this is something we need to to you brought this up at the very end. I thank you for this. Is that you know we need to be able to get out of the the demonization. You know we have to be able to look at each other as people who have to share this you know this floating rock through space for well it seems like eternity right until something happens where we're no longer on this floating rock through space we have to be able to coexist you know tm their little trademark um and not running in cheek like actually be able to live together um otherwise what's the point like what what are what are we doing and if we we can't do that then i think we're in a really sad place but i think there are enough people uh, we're seeing this right now more and more people are starting to engage in the actual discourse who weren't engaging before that I think right there will help change the tenor of the conversation from the polarized, the demonized uh, few, because when, when those loud voices are now no longer as amplified because there are more voices in the middle who are speaking out and just by sheer volume, they outweigh those loud voices. That's going to be a really, really interesting time that we're going to be in. So with that being said, they got to go ahead and keep along the uh, the ride with us, Olivia. Uh, they can go ahead and follow me over at B. Nichols Liberty. Where can they go ahead and support you? On Twitter, I'm at Rondo Livia. That's R-O-N-D-E-A-U-L-I-V-I-A. -E and on Instagram, I'm Rondo.Olivia. I also have a YouTube channel as well. I'm trying to find the time to really start it back up again. But you can find my channel on YouTube at just my name, Olivia Rondo. Perfect. And how about this, folks? We'll make it easy for you. We'll include all the links there in the show notes. All you got to do, go to your podcast catcher that you're enjoying right now and click the Brian Nichols Show artwork. It'll bring you to today's episode where you can go ahead and find, yes, uh, all of Olivia's social media links. Plus, we'll include the entire transcript of today's episode for you. Why not? And also, you can go find almost, are you ready for this, Olivia? Almost all 500 episodes here of the Brian Nichols Show. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Episode 500. It's right around the corner. And by like right around the corner, it's on Wednesday. So yeah, That's stay funny. tuned, folks. But uh, otherwise, with that being said, it's Brian Nichols signing off here on The Brian Nichols Show for Olivia Rondo. We'll see you tomorrow. Listening to The Brian Nichols Show. Find more episodes at briannicholsshow.com.